Welcome to our workshop on architectural guidelines and best practices for scalable circuit QED quantum computing. My name is Moritz Kirste and I work at the company Zurich Instruments. You can guess from this very long title already what we want to focus on in our workshop, but still I want to give you a very short introduction why we at Zurich Instruments organize this workshop together with Frank Wilhelm Mauch and how this is related to what we do as a company and uh, what we do in quantum computing. So Zurich Instruments is very well known for lock-in amplifiers, but in 2014, we also started to look into quantum computing by integrating an AWG into one of our lock-in amplifiers. This grew quickly, and in 2018, we introduced our QCCS system to the market. Our QCCS system is our quantum computing control system, which you can see here on the right-hand side in this nice picture. Our goals in this uh, quantum computing market is to help build the quantum computer, obviously, and also to be the leading quantum computing control system provider. And the strategy we follow here is to active participation in research projects and with experts in the field, like, for example, in the Open Supercube project. And another approach here is to, for example, organize this workshop. So this gives you a little bit of the idea behind this work workshop to get again in this direct contact and this direct talk with experts in the field to again shape maybe roadmaps for future scalable quantum computing. Now, this sketch here shows the full quantum stack in a simplified manner. So you see at the very top, the algorithm layer, and you see at the very bottom, the quantum device layer. We at Zurich Instruments, we are in between of those two layers. And physicists and business people are very interested in the top layer, layer where good publications and money can be retrieved. The bottom layer is also of high interest to experimental physicists. And one could say that these layers in between are often less favored as they are seen as something just like engineering problems. But we here, we, we believe that exactly these engineering problems are needed to be solved for scalable quantum computers. And what we also see are two very strong development paths in quantum computing right now. So one of these paths, which we call technology thrust, is focusing, for example, on coherence time or gate fatalities and speed. And most of the endeavors we see at the moment are focusing within this technology thrust in certain research labs in the, well, all over the world. But this workshop here now is focusing on what we call scaling thrust. So we really want to get into contacts with experts in the field and see what are the best roadmaps we should follow to see how we can get into this scaling thrust um, well, pass, so to say. So let me ask this question at the beginning of the workshop. What does it take to build a scalable quantum computer? And to answer this question, we have organized three sessions. The first session will focus on collaborative approaches between academia and research. The second session will focus on architectural approaches. And the third session will focus on software approaches. We have invited experts from the field, which will tell us about their roadmaps, which they have followed so far. Let's say the pitfalls they have successfully avoided, but maybe the pitfalls they also fell into. And what, of the, what are the obstacles we should avoid to go into in the future? So they should give us their personal view of how the community should, well, develop scalable quantum computers in the future. And I think we as an audience, uh, and we as a chair also, we have to focus our discussions and questions on what is still needed, how can we avoid common mistakes, and what actions are still required. And I think a very best outcome of this workshop could be that we agree on a general set of guidelines, or at least come up with ideas of general set of guidelines, which we can then focus on, and then maybe further focus on in, let's say, the coming weeks, days, and years. Now, a first look at the agenda. We are already sort of in the first session. Um, I said already, this is about collaborative approaches. 
the session started already now. It will continue until 12.15, then we'll have a little break. We start again at one o'clock, have another break at uh, half past two, and then we'll start again at quarter past three. So let's start our first session. We are already behind the introduction and we have structured our session in the following way. And now we have to see whether this poll works. Can I get a positive thumbs up for that or not yet? I get a thumbs up. That's a nice, nice news. Okay, so we, have, we had the following idea. Let's start our session with a poll. And we tried to shape some questions which are, let's say, a little bit provocative in a certain matter. And we ask everybody in the session to answer this poll. And then we would like the speakers to maybe also reflect some of the answers people have given in the poll, if possible. But we want to do that poll again after the speakers have given their talks. And maybe we can see that, well, the speakers were successful in shaping maybe the results of the poll. So trying to convince people of their personal view of how this roadmap should be done. Each speaker will talk approximately maybe 15 to 20 minutes. You can see here from the agenda, we have then time for two or three very short uh, direct questions. And then in the end, we have much more and longer time for general discussion. So the chat is open all the time. Please post all your questions to the speaker into the chat. We leave it open for everybody in the session at the moment. And uh, the co-chairs in the background, they will summarize these questions and then I can ask these questions to the speakers. So Frank Willem Mauch is the director of the Institute for Quantum Computing Analytics in Munich. He is a theoretical physicist and an expert on quantum and solid state theory. He's also the coordinator of the European project Open SuperQ, which is part of the quantum flagship. And he's a member of the German and American physical societies and serves on the IEEE benchmarking working group for quantum computing and on the cryoelectronics roadmap editorial board. Welcome, Frank. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. And please go ahead, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks for having me, uh, which I can also wholeheartedly say, even though I was listed as an organizer, because as an organizer, I was very lazy. I think uh, my organization contribution was two phone calls. So um, indeed, so now I have um, the results in the middle of my screen for question two, which ideally somebody would make a, go make go away because I need to see my screen. So. Um, Indeed, this is an unusual talk because I'm not talking about science, I'm talking about ways of engagement. So even though this has a logo and this has an affiliation, ultimately I'm just expressing my own opinions here. And I try to kind of define a few notions um, for uh, about uh, public and uh, private sector engagement so the next speakers don't have to. Okay. Now, how do I make, uh, here we go. So um, the mission again is to talk to lay out some terminology. So we kind of have an informed discussion later. And these are all kind of observations about the community. So they're not natural science, they're social science in which A, I'm not an expert um, and B, they are not really black and white. Uh, most statements I will make um, are kind of on a gray scale. I will first talk about to you a bit where I'm coming from, then show how public-private partnership is done in Open Super Q, then talk a little bit about what I see, what the different types of players are, what I think needs to be done and who should do it in the next years and how one could engage. So this is coming from me and I think the main thing that qualifies me to give this talk is that I've been around the block for a few times and I'm old. So I've been in superconducting qubits research for over 20 years. I had uh, faculty positions at uh, various continents. And as of July 1st, I'm at a national lab in Germany. I've been in collaboration with public and private partners also on different continents. I'm a little bit helping startups. I am supervising industrial graduate students. This is, I think, a model that doesn't exist in all countries, but essentially there's graduate students who don't have to do coursework in Germany who are employed by companies, uh, but also visit my group and ultimately get a degree under my supervision. And I'm also advising governments. 
So in the flagship co uh, um, project that I'm coordinating, it's running, it has just entered its third year. We have 10 partners from five countries and we want to uh, get onto the uh, level of up to 100 qubits, 50 to 100 qubits. So we have a quantum computer that's a real computer that you cannot just easily simulate. And we want to make this available at the central site. And um, what I wanted to show you, and this is kind of, I think a good snapshot on the European public private landscape who is in there. There are four universities, which is actually not completely true. There are only three right now because my old place has withdrawn. Um, there are two research and technology organizations uh, who are a bit similar to national labs in the US, but not quite, and I'll explain this a bit more. And there are four industry partners, all of who are small and medium enterprises. And this is kind of reflected in the roles. The universities are in our consortium. And I think this is kind of the way how you want to have an all European team. This is a very natural way of doing this. This is where the core quantum functionality is done. So um, um, the applications that are truly quantum, algorithms, chip fabrication, measurement. Because these are the labs where, you know, also in the US companies have kind of grown out and where people are obviously coming from. Then on the bottom, you see the four companies who are all making engineering and tools that are focused on quantum, but that are not in all cases quantum specific. So you can use Zurich Instruments Electronics also for completely different tasks. The same is true for Blue Force, who make cryostats, for No Noise Factory, and Euris may help me with program management. So they're responsible for my sanity, uh, not an easy task. And then the research and technology organizations are doing the part of engineering that is rather specific to this platform, but not easy to commercialize, like uh, hosting the final uh, uh, results, like uh, making some um, uh, amplification packaging and 3D integration, uh, which are not easily transferable, but which also require kind of training beyond the lifetime of a typical graduate student. We also engage with the rest of the community where we have an advisory board, uh, a science board and a user board. And let me focus on the latter two. The science board are those members of the community who could be on the top of the last list. So who work for quantum computing, they're mostly academics and who want to benefit from some of the transferable tools we develop. Whereas the user board are people who are interested in getting a first look and they are almost all companies. So let me comment, and this is just laying the baseline on what I see at the landscape, because when we say public sector, um, and I'm avoiding the word academia in most of this talk besides this slide, we really have very, very different players. We should not forget that a lot of our community is rooted in liberal arts colleges, so in institutions that even don't give out PhDs. Ben Schumacher, the guy who invented the word qubit, is it Kenyon, William Wouters, and Fred Strauch, Arad Williams, and so on. We have um, academic institutions where there's a few people who are well-known players in the field. I count my old place, Saarland, Syracuse, McGill, and others. Then there are centers where there's critical mass and people who have already been hired are brought together. Here's also a few examples. And there are special purpose institutes. I make the difference between the latter two that typically the centers bring to people bring together people who are already there and then hire some more. And the special purpose institutes, they are started and then they hire people. And of course, the distinction is not black and white. Now, you should also keep in mind, and this is again also a bit country specific, that we have on the public sector research side, we have national labs, typically big infrastructures, uh, many of them actually with a nuclear history, like Jülich, but also like uh, most of the DOE labs. But then specifically in Europe, we have research organizations where the subunits are a bit smaller. Um, they're not these uh, behemoths, um, but as a network, they are very powerful, such as the CEA and the CNRS in France, the JNR in Italy, but also the Max Planck Society in Germany. And those are truly research focused places and they can do things that people on the left cannot do. Um, 
Then there are applied science organizations, which are quite similar to the former, but have an industrial drive, such as Fraunhofer in Germany and VTT. And there are also various hybrids, like the Russian Quantum Center, which I don't fully understand. But also in private sector, let's keep in mind that uh, depending on where we are, we may have very different kind of focus on these different players. So if you look at large organizations, uh, system integrators that go for the full stack and that are part of an even larger company, I count IBM, Google, Microsoft, Honeywell, BBN, Alibaba, should be a comma between Honeywell and BBN, um, um, who want to uh, do uh, uh, satisfy as much of the stack as possible, but who are also companies that have a lot of other business and a lot of other experience. Then there are participants that do not address the full stack, but that are also parts of your huge companies, such as Intel, who focus on FAB, and Atos, who focus on compilers and software. And then, and specifically in Europe, we have companies that are only interested as users and that sometimes have an ecosystem on their own, but shouldn't, um, that have large organizations, but the internal effort is a few people, such as all German car makers, but also BASF. These are basic chemicals company, and the older among us also remember them for making cassette tapes. Total, Ford, and companies like this. Now, small organizations um, are, for example, the full stack startups, uh, IOQ, Rigetti, IQM, who have a big effort compared to the players on the left, but it's all they do. So they just uh, do quantum computing. Then there are focused specialists. So companies that don't serve the full stack and that are small. And I've yet to find one that makes hardware. This seems to be something that is quite uh, specific to software and should be contrasted to generalists with a large quantum component, such as our host of ZI, Blue Force or Low Noise Factory that also sell to non-quantum computing clients and by this can get more leverage. And then there are consultants. And one thing that is interesting, for example, in the European funding model and also in some European countries, the reason why we have SMEs in Open Super Q is that some of the development cost for them is part of the project and is thus paid um, by uh, the European Commission. Uh, so this is attractive uh, for them and it's attractive for us because we can ask them for specialized things without feeling bad because they get paid by the project. And um, it's also interesting that none of the large system integrators on the top left is European. Let's look a little bit about what I perceive are the risks and incentives of the different organizations. So if I want to do cool physics, but I'm not really sure whether this helps the quantum computer, I should probably, and these are just now hypotheses and feel free to criticize me on the end. I think this should be mostly done at university because it's at least beyond a certain proportion how to justify it a company. But you know, it can make a great PhD. But on the contrary, there are many tasks, and I know John Martinez talked to me before he moved to Google that this is difficult at universities, that are super important engineering tasks, but that is very hard to convince uh, the second reviewer of the PhD thesis that it is actually worth getting a PhD for, so it's difficult to do at universities. Also, there are grand challenges, things that will not pay off to anybody in the short scale, where we need patience which for me is, I think, a role for research and technology organizations, specifically if there's winter, I think uh, these play a crucial role. Also, um, liberal arts colleges actually can, you know, they did quantum foundations before it was cool. So they probably have a role in this. And of course, many others also, but I think there's a specialty here. Um, if you want to have a very focused effort for exploration, you should probably be a small organization, so you don't have to convince too many stakeholders. But on the other hand, if you want to leverage a lot of things internally, you should be in a big organization. Uh, my understanding, and Jerry may comment on that, is that IBM could, of course, leverage a lot of skills that were already in IBM, but not quantum specific, that they needed to find and develop further. And then for ecosystems, I think we need to have these joint networks. Let's talk a little bit about, about risks and problems. So in university, the real challenge is that in most countries, we actually France is an exception. We have the faculty or drop career. So it's extremely competitive until you get a faculty job. So a good professor at a university um, needs to make sure that everybody is able to leave their group to their next job, which is tenured, which is really in for some cases unsustainable. 
and we need to make them hireable in faculty silos. So people between computer science and physics often fall through the cracks because nobody believes that they can do first year teaching. On the other hand, and I think here we are sometimes envious looking at our American colleagues is that in Europe, many industrial uh, projects have to create some benefit uh, already in three years, which is often hard to justify in quantum computing. Research organizations are often big and uh, have long-term planning cycles. Actually, in my organization, it's seven years. So it's very hard for them to react. Industrial players, um, of course, need to get talent from somewhere, um, typically from universities. Large organizations sometimes have issues with departmentalization. Small organizations often need to buy a lot of things. If you are a small quantum computing hardware start, uh, startup and you need to buy a fridge and a micro setup, there's your basic investment that you need to convince somebody for. And of course, companies have a very natural need, note I don't complain about this, to keep sometimes things secret, which academics often don't like. Now, if I look at the status and challenges right now, let me put out the statement, and again, please feel free to criticize me, I'm overly bold, that NISC machines are research and development infrastructure, which is one reason why I'm at a large lab. They are infrastructure because they are big and they are multi-user, and they are R&D because they are not, dis I've shown you pictures on the right why they are big, and they are not useful tools yet economically. So users from industry, like my colleagues in the car industry, use them to develop and extrapolate to see when they need to buy one. So we should uh, keep this in mind. We will hopefully have societal benefit, but we are not there yet. And I think here's a good role for RTOs. But sometimes companies also do this. For example, the next speaker, I, uh, I believe Jerry's the next speaker. Um, uh, they've done a tremendous, uh, they're doing a tremendous service with the offerings in this area even though it's a traditional um, RTO thing. What I see as challenges in the field is superconducting hardware. We really need an order of magnitude better T1 and T2. And that may require some very hard material science, which probably needs all hands on deck. Um, and um, we also RTOs, I think, have a role in technology organizations. In algorithms, we actually do not have so many truly disruptive different algorithms. The art of application is to map use cases onto algorithms. And these type of algorithms are also discovered. They take a long time. Um, this can be, you know, one per career of a senior computer science professor. And um, I think this is something uh, where really traditional academics will have a strong role. And this is never exclusive, these pink lines. Heuristics and speed up. We have a lot of algorithms where the speed up is not proven, but it's heuristic. And I think there is a challenge that we would really have a database of heuristics. And it's very hard because these are often trade secrets to collect this. And I would encourage people to give out their experience in benchmarking QAOA cases um, as much as possible, as openly as possible with some type of sanitized data. Cold electronics and wiring. As much as we love Zurich instruments, um, at some point, probably uh, some part of the electronics needs to get cold, uh, which has been tried for a long time and which is again a, which is probably not a university effort because uh, this goes beyond the lifetime of a graduate student. User base, getting more people in is uh, something I think for industry and RTOs and training is clearly a university issue, but I think it's important that we train, train people the right way. So universities who now all develop quantum engineering programs should do this with industrial input. I'm almost done. Um, models of engagement, no one can do it all in the long run. I think uh, some organizations bravely do this, but uh, they also buy things. Um, the bigger machine gets the system and industry can just buy in supplies. Um, universities can do track transfer, but this is often also a bit clunky. But we should also keep in mind engagement, for example, from IARPA was a bit like NASA. So you commission a big device and let people send parts like on the Saturn V on the right, or you buy the whole thing, which I think a lot of European organizations are currently doing, and many of them are IBM customers, which is like ASA works out. What are challenges? What I is often difficult, I think. Often there are very unclear expectations of cash flow. I know a lot of my academic colleagues who think if there's an industry partner, they will pay for everything. Nope. Um, you will apply for something together. IP rules. 
Um, so IP is always a hot button issue because the uh, marketing capabilities are quite asymmetric. Universities cannot market IP the same way companies do, but companies of course would like to have a symmetric deal. And in Europe, there is very strict state aid law. So even if universities want to be generous, they're often forbidden to do so. And I think this needs to be solved and we're not getting the right boiler plates for this. Um, also, I think uh, it needs to be always acknowledged that sometimes academics are just busy with teaching. And um, openness and the need for trade secrets need to be balanced. For example, my university allows PhD defenses to be closed and with an NDA, but not all do, uh, which is good for industrial PhD students. But also at some point in the information needs to be released um, after some expiry date. And the tra technology transfer models of university are often very slow. They're often made for marketing a drug or something. They're often very patent based. So, um, and sometimes uh, nobody speaks English in the tech transfer office. Not at my place, but I've seen this. So we have to think a bit what uh, new things are we can do. And I think one thing is important is uh, to do this through people. Um, we have not, I think, really yet defined how research, sometimes researchers go from academia to industry, the way back is much less well-defined. And I think we all need uh, to uh, clarify these IP things early and honestly, um, and probably at some point before there are real stakes in there. And I think everybody needs to clarify and understand that they have a role because to, we are still fighting nature's unwillingness to stay quantum coherent. And um, I think nobody is all powerful that uh, they could say that of these, of these type of slides, they would be able to do everything. Uh, this is also true for industry. And also prof German professors like I tend to believe that they're perfect human beings and they can do everything. I understand that this is not true. Uh, which you have also seen by me running over time and by me making funny statements. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for running a bit over. Don't worry, Frank. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we had problems with the poll at the beginning, so don't worry. Um, I'm looking at the time as well. I'm looking at the chat for question. Now, I think um, the questions I see from the chat, I could also answer in the end, or sorry, ask. <laughs> I think you have to answer them, <laughs> but I can ask them in the end. Now, just a very short uh, question, maybe from the audience, or I can allow one maybe short question. If there is someone who has a direct question, please maybe use the reaction button. I could see that you are reacting, and then I can see that you have a direct question and I could give you the microphone. That's not the case. I would directly move on. And uh, as I said at the beginning, leave the other questions for the end for the general discussion. So thanks, Frank, again. Let us all, uh, there's no feature in T, uh, oh yeah, actually there is a feature in Zoom to thank Frank. Maybe now we can try the reaction button to give him some applause. And while we do that, maybe Jerry can already start sharing his screen. All right. Very for, first, very short introduction of you, <laughs> Jerry. Thanks for your uh, contribution already. Um, Jerry Chow is the director of quantum hardware system development at IBM. He's leading the effort to plan and implement IBM's quantum hardware systems through design, characterization, and system integration. His technical expertise is in the area of superconducting qubit quantum computing. And he joined IBM as a research staff member in 2010. 2016, he co-led the IBM Quantum Experience project that made a real quantum processor accessible to anyone on the cloud, an achievement recognized with the 2019 Gold Edition Award in the next-gen computing category. Welcome, Jerry. I'm very Excellent. much looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, thanks, thanks to everyone who's uh, attending this event and thank you to Zurich Instruments overall for putting this together. I think it's a really interesting and uh, uh, relevant topic of discussion that everyone is uh, very interested in. And I think Frank did a wonderful job of setting the stage to, to find some of these elements that come into play with regards to public and private um, partnerships, uh, the whole ecosystem. I love how he uh, was able to really 
um, put us all on a map in terms of the large scale, small scale uh, companies, as well as different types of academic players, you really sees the diversity, right? You really see the diversity of the, of, of interests throughout um, the ecosystem. And what, what I want to do today is uh, I might jump around a little bit with this because it kind of, it, I guess the, the idea was for this to be a little bit dynamic, but I wanted to give you guys um, uh, the picture of how we are uh, approaching the enablement of this full ecosystem and, and how we see um, the intermeshing of uh, academia or, or if you will, the public sector with the private and industry sector. And then, you know, I'll also add to that um, uh, things like national labs uh, uh, from which uh, you'll probably hear from uh, Travis a little bit about right after myself, um, but how this all really needs to work together. And I saw that the one poll uh, that had the most uh, uh, votes on the first one, at least, was that we all need to work together, right? And um, I hope that I do give that message, you see that message too. Um, for, from our perspective, I, I, if those of you who attended my keynote, I talked on this, but I want to emphasize it again, that what we see is for this quantum industry to really grow. Um, we're still in the early days, but we, there's really a, a number of facets that we need to, to focus on. So there's the delivery of quantum systems, right, from the hardware perspective, continuing to make systems that are relevant for the entire community to work on, uh, define sp um, specifics, uh, specifications even of those systems so that even the hardware engagement can uh, can be can be done for, like, for example, uh, a vendor partner like uh, Zurich Instruments. Um, and then similarly, this needs to sit upon a open access cloud infrastructure with uh, open source software so that you can really get those academic users to, to really uh, develop a um, uh, new ideas for software and applications, right? And so this, uh, this requires uh, stability uh, and really looking at the, the full stack of software to, to, to enable uh, the actual usage of those underlying systems. Now, of course, centered around all that is the enablement piece, right? So we need, we need to be able to drive this quantum workforce. I think this whole week, you're gonna hear a lot of people talking about that uh, with, with regards to, 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 to educational um, assets that are needed to do so, uh, develop the right professional services and, and, and really find ways to enable that, right? So I think that's where the uh, industry certainly has a role. Uh, academia is, has a huge role, right? But that we need to do that kind of in, in, in concert together. Um, so just to, to, to give a quick snapshot again of where we are with, uh, with our efforts at IBM, right? As a, as a private company, uh, we, we however really, really value the full ecosystem and try to enable it, right? And so what we've been doing is to, to through the quantum experience uh, with cloud accessible uh, systems or uh, 29 systems since the past four years, enabling over 240,000 users. Um, and really here uh, generating a lot of scientific value through uh, papers, right? And that's, what, that's probably what we see uh, as one of the, the, the most um, interesting metrics for what we have done with quantum experience. Uh, and for that matter with Qiskit, right? Really enabling this open source uh, platform for development. Now, the, this, is, this all points to that whole concept of co-design, right? Really that we need to do this together. There's no, there are elements that, are, that, are, uh, that can be optimized in certain areas, be it pu public versus private, uh, but a lot of it is feeding one another and we can't do anything in a vacuum, right? So what we do at IBM Quantum is to advance the technology platform while enabling all of our partners, the public included within that set of partners. Uh, and then with our partners, what we want to see is them working on how to uh, advance applications and other enabling technologies that's, that further guide the directions that we want to go in, right? And so really uh, one feeds the other and the other feeds uh, IBM. So uh, one thing that we definitely see, right, from uh, just using the software uh, stack as a, as, a, as a kind of model, right, for, for how uh, we want to approach uh, this type of industry and public engagement uh, really is to define what we call frictionless development all the way through the stack from the very bottom to the top. And uh, a, a neat little way that we've, we've defined this, in fact, from the software perspective is, is defining different classes of developers. You have uh, kernel developers that want to work really understanding how to use some of the pulses and, uh, and, and you know, changing the amplitudes on a Zurich Instruments box, for example. Uh, you have algorithm 
developers that want to work on understanding how to make better compilers at the circuit level so that you can turn the CNOT gates that you need into the right uh, decomposed uh, hardware operations. And then you have the model of developers where this is where really developing new applications, uh, going towards um, chemistry, machine learning, those types of uh, end users uh, want to really be able to, to develop. And, and this is where we start seeing this funnel of sizes of developers, right? And that we want to be able to, to have the right tools to um, allow for this, this intermixing and, and collaboration, right? And so with the circuit itself as the basis, uh, we're defining a lot of pieces to appeal to the kernel developer, right? So for example, the idea of the of of of, of open pulse as something for uh, um, for for kernel developers to develop uh, to to program and and at the pulse level, uh, algorithm developers to be able to use various patterns of circuits, right? So that they can actually then develop better compilers, uh, program in different types of uh, of entanglement operations, and what you start to see is as we go up the stack. We, we start increasing the total number of developers in the, in the, either in academia or throughout the world that starts to want to engage, right? And at some level, we want to be able to, to, to uh, give access to, uh, to full programs and application modules uh, in which the end users are, 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 might not even really know too much about the quantum computer itself, uh, but are yet able to touch and engage with the systems as well. So that's kind of the inverted uh, that's kind of the funnel of like going from that the, at the hardware level all the way up. And then I actually do want to touch on one other piece on there, which is if we go all the way down to that very little, uh, to the particular hardware design, right? And that's, that's going to be uh, dependent on what kind of qubits that you're going to have. Uh, you, you also want to find some way to have an entry point for, for those that want to design actual circuits, uh, quantum circuits at the, at the, at the physical level. Uh, and so I actually want to just uh, advertise for, for Zlatko from our team who will be uh, at his session this Friday, who'll be talking a little bit about, about a fun little project we've had as an extension to Kiskit uh, towards that idea of, uh, of, of uh, uh, quantum hardware design, but also in, the, in an open source fashion. So now wrapping this all together, right? So what we want to do is build this quantum industry uh, enable this ecosystem. It's done through various elements, including the access to technology, having that room for research to be done uh, that, that can feed into uh, development cycles, the, the development of skills and training through the right, um, through the right uh, um, education modules and training, uh, and then having that vision to tie into economies, right? Uh, as Frank mentioned, there's the Open SuperQ project uh, in Europe, uh, but also, you know, in the in the uh, in our case in the United States with the National Quantum Initiative, having that view across the industry and larger landscape uh, in order to cohesively um, uh, drive the agenda together, All right? So from the technology access point, I, I won't go into this uh, again, but just enabling uh, users to have access to a large number of uh, systems with a high amount of availability. Uh, from the uh, education and workforce piece, open source, um, uh, open source educational materials, uh, the Kiskit, which is of course open source software stack uh, in Python, uh, open source textbook that we have where you can learn how to program and use quantum computers. Um, so really, this is all, I, I kind of want to point to that this has really helped enable a lot, right, that is thus far, and we see this as uh, the, the public and, and, and private coming together through the enabling this research. It's changed how we actually uh, are able to have collaborations, how the whole field is able to, 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 to drive together and steer in, 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 in a really, you know, uh, useful direction. Uh, similarly, we engage with industry, right? So not simply just with the public, but with direct partners as well who have particular problems of interest that they have, be it in chemistry uh, or optimization, uh, but to really uh, find ways to have these near-term systems uh, tailored to particular problems of interest in their uh, respective realms. Um, just wanted to touch on uh, just how we can really uh, make this a global community, right? So we have recently had a Kiskit summer school that had over 4,000 re registered attendees. Um, and uh, overall, it was a, it, for us, it was a huge success. Uh, in some sense, uh, we were able, we, we, 
rather than have something that was just going to be by travel only due to the restrictions of travel, it kind of forced us down this path, but we were really able to make it a very, very um, uh, rewarding uh, virtual event for a, a number, a large number of people throughout the world. Uh, and so, you know, directions like this where we can really have a broader community talking about quantum, learning about quantum is, is, is a really, really big, big part of this. Um, on the, on the idea of uh, national scale partnerships, uh, this is where uh, at IBM we are engaging with, uh, with Germany and as well as with Japan to actually push on uh, systems to be deployed in those respective countries uh, along the same lines with the National uh, Quantum Initiative and what the White House uh, OSTP is offer, uh, office has, has announced uh, to form the NQI um, uh, as we've heard about in, in early September. Um, our role there really is to find ways that we support that and also engage that to succeed, right? So it's not like we're competing with it, but in fact, what we want to do is align with it. And uh, this is actually precisely what we've done with this particular uh, set of DOE centers, which is that we are participating in fact across three DOE centers um, that are all aligned with what we see as core elements to the full uh, quantum research roadmap that we have, right? So developing new uh, co-design error correction codes, uh, developing novel interconnects to build towards quantum intranets, uh, as well as advancing um, uh, the, the capability of applications on near-term hardware. Now, the, the last thing I just wanted to touch on, right, and um, uh, probably out, out of time pretty soon, but I wanted to uh, give this, the, the, give, at least describe the, the difference of what we see as research and development and deployment. There's a lot, there's some questions that are in there, uh, which are uh, talking about, which are asking about, so what do you do in industry versus in academia, right? And why, where are those, wh where do you, where is it better to do something in industry versus academia? And I think that the, the bottom line comes down to actually defining what's different in terms of research development and deployment. Research really is what you would say is focused on developing, uh, is what you uh, would say is focusing on new ideas, right? A lot of the um, uh, understanding novel things that, uh, novel physics, right? A lot of these elements that come into play that really can change the game and change the picture of what you might want to, um, uh, what, how you might actually approach your entire systems. Development, we need to make that distinction in that what it is, is it's, you can think of it as, as longer cycles, but iterative, iterative solutions and engineering solutions to certain problems. And the development cycles can be, um, can be overlaying one another, right? And so that's where going towards, say, for us, in our case, the next deployed system, we have 27 qubit systems, 65 qubit systems. These are all development cycles in which that we're actually solving these particular problems for an end, in the end, deployable product. And that's where the deployment comes in. And that's really when it's a vetted out system that can be uh, deployed and accessed and used by others, right? But that distinction between R and D is something that, that I think is lost a, a little bit. So, and and uh, the, the point and the role of industries that a lot of the infrastructure that we have to advance development cycles are kind of in place. They are what we are fine tuning as we, as we learn generation after generation, right? And then also because of the overlapping nature of various development cycles, uh, we have to plan ahead, right? And so it's not as agile as what you can do on the research side, whereas to explore all kinds of new novel, uh, novel elements, you know, new materials, very new, uh, you know, things like new junctions or new uh, qubit designs. That's, where, that's what you're gonna focus on research. But from the industry side, what we want to be able to do is have that roadmap that we're going to build towards, right? And I think the critical thing that we are in with quantum is we need all these together. A lot of times the traditional uh, landscape of this is you do your research, something becomes bubbles up and is good enough that you feed into development and industry, uh, and then it goes to push product. And instead we're in a much shorter loop here where all of this is kind of happening together. And it goes back to that kind of co-design wheel where we're all bringing it together uh, kind of in parallel so that we're, we're learning together and influencing what we are doing in research and what we can actually engineer towards uh, a deployable product. Um, and so with that, I will end my, end my talk. Thank you very much, Jerry. Again, um, we are a little bit over time, but this is completely fine. 
um, direct question directly to Jerry. Otherwise, all other questions after. I don't see any reaction from anybody. Okay, so let's thank Jerry. Travis, I think you can uh, already start sharing. Let's everybody uh, thank Jerry for his talk and please try to use the reaction button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting. Then you will see also how to raise your hand to maybe um, have a direct question. All right. Now, well, our next speaker will be Travis Humble. He is a distinguished scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the director of uh, its Quantum Computing Institute and deputy director of the DOE Quantum Science Center. His background is in theoretical chemistry and he is now developing the infrastructure and use cases for quantum computing to impact DOE's vision of scientific discovery. He also holds a joint faculty faculty appointment with the University of Tennessee Bradison Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Graduate Education, where he mentors students on developing energy efficient computing solutions. Welcome, Travis. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Maurice. This is a wonderful opportunity and I very much appreciate the invitation, uh, especially to follow Frank and Jerry, which I think uh, they both gave excellent insights into this uh, uh, public-private partnership uh, that's gonna be necessary for, for developing quantum computers going forward. I wanna bring my perspective on how you know, national laboratories within the United States uh, at the Department of Energy can intersect with a lot of the efforts that are happening both in academia as well as in industry. And through that, be part of this co-design process that, that Jerry was alluding to. I think that is an important part of the phase that we're in at the moment. And, um, you know, my presentation is designed to give you some insights into how I view advancing scientific discovery uh, with quantum computers through this partnership. For those who don't know, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is a Department of Energy federally funded research and development center. It's located in the eastern half of Tennessee. And what I like about the picture you see here is that it really encompasses the mission of the laboratory. You can see that there are several uh, different facilities located around here. The uh, lower portion of this figure represents our material science and discovery uh, division of the laboratory. Up here in the upper left is our spallation neutron source, one of the brightest sources of neutrons in the world, which is important for characterization of new materials. Over here on the right is the high flux isotope reactor, which is one of the world's only sources of rare medical isotopes. And then in the center of this picture, located uh, right here, is the uh, Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility which is our uh, user facility for standing up the, the nation's fastest uh, supercomputers. And that's an important capability that addresses all of the other scientific discovery missions within the laboratory because it's mainly used for modeling and simulation. Uh, and is an important tool for researchers, not only at Oak Ridge, but around the world. In terms of those modern high-performance computing systems that are located at, at Oak Ridge, we've seen a steady progression starting uh, back in, with Titan nearly a decade ago of massively parallel processors uh, that make use of accelerated nodes, and in particular, make use of GPU uh, accelerators in order to offload special purpose calculations that can then accelerate scientific computing. We're currently uh, hosting the Summit system, uh, one of the world's fastest supercomputers, again, based on an accelerator model. And we're already designing and building the next generation system called Frontier, which again is based on the idea that I can partition my workloads for modeling and simulation across many cores, but then offload those workloads onto accelerated devices that speed up those calculations. Now, this has been a great paradigm for building future supercomputers, and it's always depended on our partnership between the industry components of making those devices and the scientific components which drive the use cases for why those devices are needed. But it's unclear what happens beyond frontier in vision of system architecture and design. 
And this is what's motivated our consideration of quantum computing at Oak Ridge, because we view that may be a potential pathway moving forward in high performance computing. And the reason is that if you look at the use cases of, of current scientific computing, it's mainly focused on applications that fundamentally have some aspect of quantum mechanics within them. Whether it's material science, physics, high energy physics, astrophysics, biology, or chemistry, the fundamental laws of nature are almost always represented in some version of quantum mechanics that becomes an important bottleneck in terms of scaling up these calculations to larger and larger systems. Going forward, we can anticipate that if we build new architectures for high performance computing that address quantum mechanics, we may actually see new domains of science open up that uh, become affordable for modeling and simulation and therefore scientific discovery. Now, of course, you've probably seen this before. Uh, if you wanna make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And it's a very pointed quote uh, to all of us at, the, at Quantum Week where the idea of using quantum mechanics, uh, the fundamental forces of nature in order to perform computation is an incredibly powerful one. But the rest of the quote also emphasizes that it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. So there's a flip side to this coin, which is that it's going to be a lot of work to get there, but is it really worth that effort? And this is the place where we are currently in evaluating quantum computing. Does it really provide us the long-term benefits that we hope for once we take into consideration all the many different architectural issues? Presently, we know that scientific computing with quantum computers is at least possible. There are theoretical uh, statements about algorithms that indicate that, that the complexity analysis is favorable for quantum computers. Whether you're doing quantum simulation, partition functions, of course, factoring is a popular example. These theoretical statements give us hints that we can, of course, design applications on theoretical quantum computers that provide advantages in scaling. That immediately intersects with many of, the high, uh, many of the scientific domains that we have interest at at Oak Ridge and across Department of Energy, whether that's high energy physics, material science, chemistry, artificial intelligence, the, the connections seem to go on and on. But again, we return to the question of, well, how do we actually build those systems and what's the performance of those systems that we anticipate observing if they are built? This is not a question that Oak Ridge thinks that it can answer on its own. While we certainly have many people who are vested in the design of scientific applications and even looking at the co-design of quantum computers, the truth is that these problems are incredibly complicated. The systems we're talking about running them on are incredibly complex. And uh, the truth is we probably need a very strong team of multidisciplinary backgrounds in order to even begin to build that system, much less evaluate its performance. So we vision right now that there are sort of three distinct pathways around quantum computation, largely based on the theoretical models. The first on digital quantum computation is, I think, very familiar to many people, and it's in some ways the, the way to get started in quantum computing. Uh, in the middle, uh, adiabatic quantum computation represents an alternative pathway. Uh, you can see this um, manifest in the idea of quantum annealing. And then there's the idea of analog quantum computation, uh, specifically analog quantum simulation which again provides a slightly different architectural approach to how we would build these types of quantum computers. Now, all of these again gives us options in the design of future high performance quantum computing systems, but mapping those designs onto actual applications become an important part of the overall analysis. So when we stand back and we look at the current quantum processing units that are available, there's a remarkable diversity uh, based on many different uh, technologies, some of those are maturing very quickly. We still have relatively small capacities or register sizes, uh, but you know, impressive gate fidelities that seem to have uh, uh, reached the point of several nines of fidelity. Uh, the limited connectivity uh, and good addressability still prohibits uh, some scaling of these applications to larger in sizes, but most importantly, are these uh, limits due to noise and decoherence that fundamentally uh, restrict the sequence of operations that we're able to perform. Now, that being said, this is a uh, virtual playground of possibilities for exploring how scientific uh, applications can be mapped onto quantum computers. And I would say that the uh, public-private partnership that's emerged between vendors offering early access, including, of course, IBM, as well as many others, 
has enabled this type of research to occur. This is still a client-server interaction model, though. This is still focused on what I would call the playground uh, uh, paradigm, where we're trying to test and evaluate and learn and discover how we may actually use quantum computing in the future. But it's a very big step from that playground into developing a tightly integrated modern uh, high-performance computing system. And that is something where very uh, focused and um, uh, moderated discussions are necessary in order for us to make progress quickly. So for me, there's sort of a tale of two quantum computers going on in the, in the world at the moment. The first has been the long-term ideal of fault-tolerant quantum computing, which is we use redundant encoding of information in order to mitigate the entropy that creeps into these calculations. That is a long-term goal in part because of the resource requirements necessary to achieve it, there's been remarkable progress towards um, uh, incre uh, meeting those resource requirements, but it appears that we're still a long way away from actually achieving a truly fault tolerant universal quantum computer. That narrative has to contrast with where much of the research is at the moment, which is in this noisy intermediate scale quantum computer paradigm. That is that I learn to live with the errors that are, so, that are present in the devices and begin to come up with means of mitigating them or even avoiding them if possible, in order to achieve some sort of uh, quantum computation. Now, I think both of these paradigms are very attractive and represent opportunities uh, in the near term and the long term, but it's not yet clear to me whether pursuing one or the other necessarily gets you to both ends. So for that reason, I think this is an important part of the conversation where priorities between the users, which I would consider Oak Ridge to be, and the vendors such as IBM, need to come to a, 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 a vision of what we imagine the future of quantum computing looks like. Now, at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, we have started a quantum computing user program as a specific example of how public-private partnership can be an important part of, of the development of this quantum computing uh, priority. So we call it QC Up. Uh, it's managed by the, the computing facility, the same place that houses the high performance computers, and it's supported by Department of Energy's Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office. What we do is we allow users from all over the world to submit applications for time on commercial quantum computing systems that we have bought access to. We then use a merit review process and a, a hierarchy of user agreements in order for those individuals to get access to those commercial resources and then test and evaluate their ideas behind scientific computing. So this is an important program because it gets back to the idea that how we use the computers is gonna be an important part about the types of computers we need to design. For us at the Department of Energy Laboratory, we have a large, uh, strong focus on scientific discovery. The DOE has several program offices centered around computer science, uh, physics, material science, as well as fusion and nuclear physics that drive our research portfolio. So we're largely looking for projects that are aligned with Department of Energy's mission statement, but then of course explore that boundary between what we're capable with quantum computing today and what we hope will be capable in the future. Our priorities therefore are to pri uh, enable research by providing users access to, to these commercial systems to evaluate the success of that access. I wanna understand whether or not uh, the current quantum computing devices are actually on track. Are we making progress compared to where we were a year ago? Are we able to make arguments for why scientific computing can be done on these types of systems? And if so, what are the early indications of what those uh, future system designs need to look like? As a reference, when we build our current high performance computing systems, that's a process that can take up to a decade in terms of the design and planning to eventually deployment. So it's important to get early insights into what the future architectures will look like to drive this types of um, uh, designs. Now, of course, Oak Ridge itself doesn't build quantum computers or even high performance computers, but rather we see that as a partnership in which our input to that process is an important part of uh, eventually realizing that capability. Now, the other bit of all of this, and I, I think uh, Jerry was alluding to this in his talk, is that you have to support the community around this idea. It's one thing to provide access to the system, but you need a workforce that's trained and knowledgeable about these types of technologies in order to really make the most progress. So a third priority for us is engaging with the community, uh, mainly through training and development, as well as different um, 
uh, conferences and other events like IEEE Quantum Week. Now, currently within the, the QCF program, we have uh, four quantum computing resources. Uh, you can see here IBM and Rigetti in the center of the page representing uh, superconducting architectures. Uh, D-Wave also a superconducting architecture based on the quantum annealing model. Uh, and then we have a, a novel uh, architecture from Xanadu that's based on uh, quantum optics. And this is our current uh, collection of, of computing resources, but we're always looking for new opportunities to evaluate the technology. So in no way is this meant to prioritize individual technologies, but rather to say getting access to these is an important part of our mission because it helps us evaluate these technologies and then uh, cycle back on this co-design conversation of what we think needs to be in future architectures. Now, I wanted to go in a little bit more conceptually of how I'm thinking about quantum computing, especially high performance quantum computing architectures. You can see on the left, a picture at the top of what a conventional compute node within our um, high performance systems look like. This is actually the summit uh, uh, computer. You can see the three GPUs and they're talking to a central CPU system. Now, I've got to try to wrap my head around the idea that I'm going to migrate my existing users and my existing code base to the sets of systems that you see down at the bottom, which to some degree are largely isolated physical laboratories with highly precision uh, instruments enabling quantum mechanical effects. Translating that into a paradigm of high performance quantum computing is something that's going to take a lot of uh, work and effort, including the architectures. And so the three schematics you see on the right represent ways in which existing high performance computers may be able to map on to these quantum computing architectures. The first of course mimics somewhat what we're doing right now through the client server interaction. A shared memory machine like your laptop or my summit supercomputer makes a remote connection to a quantum processor, a QPU, in order to offload a job. That has some advantages because it's the nearest thing that we can imagine. But as we evolve that concept over time, I think we'll naturally see parallelization and possibly um, uh, interconnected quantum processors become an important architecture in the future. But again, this, this comes back to, well, what are the application use cases that require these types of architectures and will they really be worth the expense that, that it will incur? At the moment, when I look at an individual node, I identify that there are these components uh, on the conventional side located around the CPU and the memory and perhaps a GPU accelerator. But this quantum processor as an architectural concept, it, it begins to start uh, to be more spread out and less integrated. Uh, while I can create these component diagrams that identify control units and execution units and registers, in reality, most of that right now looks like racks of electronics and uh, cabling that connect into these, um, you know, uh, large infrastructure necessary to keep the thermodynamics of the, the register cool. And, and that's where we are. And I think that driving forward the development of those designs uh, to tailor to high performance systems is going to depend on well, what's the actual application we're pursuing. If we're trying to build fault tolerant quantum computers as first priority, it's going to be a very different design than if we're looking for these um, uh, NISC type applications to demonstrate quantum advantage. Now, how the users interact with these systems has also been an important point of discussion. Currently, a lot of the interactions are driven through these interactive interfaces in which you submit an application, uh, wait for a response, and then Honestly, you manually analyze it. However, in our high-performance computing environment, we find that the users are often not involved in the feedback loop of these applications, and rather they're offloading jobs as part of a, um, an accelerator or a kernel paradigm in which the processor itself is uh, deciding when that's supposed to be allocated. And so this idea of a runtime environment and programming model intersect to give us an execution model which uh, forms the idea of an operating system to manage how quantum computers and high performance computers interact with each other. So I'm just bringing this up as an important place where again, the partnership between the users and the, the device developers are really gonna drive this middle layer that uh, determines how these things work together. So I'll just conclude with identifying what I think are some of the challenges and opportunities for partnerships going forward. Uh, you'll see on the right here this language hierarchy, which represents the different layers of uh, what I would consider the quantum computing stack. 
Um, of course, that hierarchical representation uh, exposes many different interfaces and also many different language representations that need to be selected. Coming to agreement on that is going to be an enormous step towards us becoming uh, more fluent uh, in understanding how each other are um, approaching different problems, but then also more fluent in how we specify solutions. Standards and interfaces, though, go beyond just specifying language, but also comes down to the individual components and controls and methodologies that we want to specify, and really gets to the idea of best practice. What is best practice in quantum computing at the moment? In some ways, we're, we're in the wild, wild west. Uh, there's a lot of lawless uh, designs around uh, experiments and verification and validation, but we've got to come to some consensus on this if we're going to make progress together. And of course, characterization and benchmarking has always been an important part of quantum uh, physics, but understanding how that translates over into computing has been less obvious. There's so many different, different concerns in the, in the application space, whether it's time to solution or uh, overall resources requirements or complexity or maybe even energy. And it's still uh, unknown as to what the actual metrics we need to be tracking are. There have been some great progress though, and so I'm looking forward to this area. Finally, re reliability and reproducibility uh, directly impact performance and integration. Right now, I think we make a lot of one-off systems in the quantum computing space. We, we come in, we find sweet spots, and, and we design our programs to collect data. But if we were to come back a year later, the truth is we may not see exactly the same behavior. And so this idea of reproducibility in, in uh, scientific computing is an important part of moving forward with the idea of using quantum computers uh, for our use cases. So I'll just take a breath and uh, stop there. And of course, if there's any questions, then uh, I'll be happy to, to field those before we move on. It is not working. So let's go into the discussion. I have a couple of questions here. I will um, first go, let's say, to um, I'll just be at the list. One question, sorry, uh, one second, sorry. So there's first a question to Jerry, a direct question, which was to Jerry. Um, Jerry, Jerry, you highlighted the distinction between academic and research organizations. Could you give some concrete examples for things that one or the other category are better suited for and why in context of quantum computing? So I think there's a question, yeah. Which one is better suited for what? Yeah, I think I tried to, I, I had seen that one. That was that was where I was trying to cover that with uh, what I described between um, uh, research and development, right? So just in terms of things that require the heavy infrastructure and long long time scales for you to to, to develop out solutions for and build out uh, new technologies, right? Versus um, uh, research problems, which sure they can also take a long time, but um, they 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 can be more uh, self-contained in terms of. Uh, uh, the the self-contained in terms of the um, uh, what needs to be done, right? So uh, more exploratory things, right, are are certainly suited for the for academic uh, outlook. And then there's a later question about um, uh, you, you know the 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 um, competing requirements for for PhD programs, and it's along the same lines there, right? Like I think that at some point you we will define what what are the right quantum engineering uh, problems that should be addressed in uh, in an academic setting um, versus ones that take the longer uh, cycles of learning and the longer uh, the larger infrastructure to be in place to to develop out and flesh out that that, that is likely to be better suited in industry <clears throat> okay well Thanks for this. I would also ask uh, either Travis or Frank, if you also want to comment on that, please uh, just directly go ahead. I mean, I'm all these questions. I think people to disagree with me. It's an open, open discussion here. Please, please Frank, you want to say that, that I should answer the question about research organizations in the public sector and university. And I think um, it all comes down to the average age and the average lifetime of people. Um, if I'm at the research center, I can do things that take more than three years. And there are tenured staff scientists at research organizations, which are very rare at universities. Um, what is very difficult is to briefly jump into a topic where you say give out an honors thesis 
to uh, do something very simple that is probably also reproducing. That is very hard to do in a research organization because there are no young students around because as Travis can probably confirm, if we saw in the picture, the campuses of research organizations are typically in the middle of nowhere. Um, and um, I think that's a key, that's a key difference. If uh, you want to have a lot of new young people coming in and try something very quickly, university is the better place. But if you want to uh, do something that is hard and takes long, an RTO is the better place. So maybe I'll add to what Frank's saying. Um, I do agree that there are barriers to, to short-term research projects within large research um, organizations um, because of these timeline issues. I mean, oftentimes the, the, the cadence, you know, the, the rate at which you're expecting to get results on a, uh, a student or a graduate student um, uh, program may be shorter than it is in a, in a long-term research facility. But one of the things that I have found works well is um, trying to get the best of both worlds, you know, trying to bring in uh, students largely for training purposes, um, you know, and, and to enable them to experience so that they can eventually go off into the workforce, maybe at a research organization in industry or government. Um, but to, you know, to hold them to the, that expectation. Uh, but, but at the same time, you certainly have to invest in the, the long-term research staff at those organizations as well, because there's a long-term research agenda there. Okay. I, am, I have the feeling that this question by that person and also a couple of others have been answered by what they have been, the speakers have been reflecting. Um, let me go through the list. And uh, there's a little follow-up question to this from Stephen Cashin. Um, what do you see the role of for, this should be for everyone. So I think I'll hand this first to Jerry and then to the others. So what do you see the role of physics PhDs in the quantum industry as quantum engineering programs are further developed? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, maybe that's one thing, which is that the, the physics part of things, I think, doesn't end, right? There's still a lot of uh, really interesting physics that, that, that feeds in. So even though it's just, even though we have engineering going on, it's not like it's, it's just all engineering. Um, like a lot of things like no, the novel qubits and, and um, uh, protected qubits, um, uh, new ideas for gates, right? There, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, physics that I think is still at a level of, of, of doing PhDs to, to advance, right? And so um, much like I think, you know, in the semiconductor industry, we didn't have people stop getting semiconductor PhDs when they started having uh, development of nodes. Uh, we're, we're kind of getting to a similar situation here. I think there's even a general statement, which I, as the just retired department chair in Saarland can make, is that at least in Germany, and I think this is true for many countries, there are very few jobs that say physicists on the advertisement, yet the unemployment among physicists is extremely low. Uh, which basically points that the strength of physicists is always flexibility. So as long as you have to do a lot of different things and connect them, physics PhD has their place. When there is a task that is very standardized and where you need uh, to go much deeper, I think it's where physics turns into engineering. And there was a related question. I think uh, one thing that companies can do is to, and Jerry also said this, is to help us to define the curriculum for quantum engineering, what's really needed. And I should also, of course, point out, as we know in Germany, with a physics PhD, you can even become a leader of the free world. The um, break, yeah, so let me pick up on that. Maybe not the very last part. I don't want to compare leaders of free worlds. The, um, but I did want to pick up on the, uh, the part about what is the curriculum, right? What is the, uh, the, the curriculum for, for quantum engineering? And, and I think that in the past, physicists have had to become engineers because, because this was not yet defined. And so um, going forward, I think is a great opportunity to, to try to define what engineering is, and that may help people better uh, identify where, you know, where can they contribute, what, what overlaps with them the best. Okay. Well, I think we are now a little bit in the path of okay, education. And I think that's a very important aspect, and I've seen a lot of questions going in that direction. How um, does IBM, for example, plan on uh, 
educating and teaching the workforce. But I think we should maybe go back a little bit um, to what we wanted to talk about when we could talk about standards and best practices. And uh, I think a very important question is here, how are the, these to come about? So I think it's important that maybe, and I would start here with maybe Frank, and how do you as a speaker, now we have to poll again, I will close that. <laughs> how do you as a speaker see, or uh, who do you think should address this development of standards and best practices? Is it more, let's say, on the research side, or is it more, do you see it more on the industry side? Who would you think should be here in the lead? Um, we should obviously do this together because I think there are two things needed. Standard and best practices need to be road tested. And I think the diversity of the academic sector can do this really well. Nothing is as good for testing a best practice as giving it to the hand of an undergraduate. On the other hand, um, uh, only standards that are really obey followed and accepted by industry have a point. And um, I think one important role, I think probably industry is typically a driver for this. Of course, one role of uh, the public sector is that um, they can uh, make a lot of what's behind the standard completely open. Um, because we do not have to, well, we, don't, we do not need to protect anything in principle. Um, so um, in this, I think this is the sharing of tasks uh, um, in this, but the best practice of, you know, of building a lab and certain things and having different scales, I think this is something that uh, academics can, can could do good contribution to. Okay. Also, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there are practices in big companies which uh, they would never, best practices in big companies which they would never share because that is part of uh, what makes them so successful. So that's, that's one of the questions I was going to ask to Jerry next, yes. <laughs> but maybe Travis, you, you turn on your microphone, maybe you can go first and then we go to, to Jerry. Well, I, I was going to say something in remarks to um, the dynamics around quantum volume. And uh, I think there's something really interesting here. So I don't want to steal anything that, that Jerry might say about it, but, but I do want to acknowledge that by being open and transparent about a definition of a metric, in this case, quantum volume, that it has spurred conversation around that metric in a way that I think is good for the field. Uh, it, it's a healthy conversation. It's an open conversation. Um, you know, I'm not saying that the, the, the metric itself can't be improved. I don't think anyone is, but, but the fact that it started as a conversation, I think is an important step towards, towards getting everybody in the, in the mindset of, you know, let's work together. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a very good point, uh, Travis. And I think that, you know, that's not just for quantum volume, but there are, there are, there are um, certain areas that of uh, the whole stack that I would say are like that, that we can define those types of best practices. Um, certainly, sure. There's certain things that are how we fab devices is not going to be, you know, shared broadly because that's very, very, very local to the, the particular infrastructure we have. Um, but, uh, you know, where there's, where there's something to be learned um, from, a, from a, especially from a physics standpoint, I think that that's certainly a, uh, it's certainly a fair game and certainly worth us having the broader academic discussion, right? There's, uh, we, we continue to uh, to find ways to uh, collaborate with uh, with academia, uh, uh, Frank was collaborating with us uh, up until about last year with, on on our logic uh, hyper project, right? So there's a lot of places there where there are common goals and objectives that uh, that we can we can define uh, where we can really uh, um, push the agenda together. Okay, I'm looking a little bit at the time. Thanks, Jerry. I think that was a very clear answer. I'm looking a little bit at the time and uh, I would like to use the last two minutes for a short statement by each of the three speakers, which is taken from the questions which we planned on asking to the audience. And that was the last question, which was supposed to be a little bit provocative. And that is going into the following direction. Let me first maybe say that question. I might also be able to post it into the chat. And that is about 
um, scalable quantum computers, or let's say scalable quantum computers would be available today. So what kind of access model would you think would be the most realistic one? Let's say you could get an, um, you could get a scalable quantum computer from now on and what access model would you think is most realistic? We had the answers that, for example, the public se sector ensures access to all users or users from academia and industry pay to provide access to these quantum computers or industry and academia build their own quantum computers for separate purposes. So maybe I start with Travis now. What do you think would be the, fur the best or most, not, not the best, this is actually not the question here. What do you think is the most realistic which yeah. we will see, let's say, in five to 10 years. So I, I think, um, oh wait, you may have thrown me a curveball there right at the end. The, um, I, what I, the question I wanted to answer was, you know, which of the, how would I re react if, if a, a vendor came to me and said, I have a scalable quantum computing system and it can meet all your, your application needs. And I think I would, I would still be in a, in a tough spot because I haven't yet figured out how to evaluate those systems. Um, you know, I have no way of certifying that you know the the statements made are true in an independent uh, you know verifiable way um, trust but verify right that's the uh, the motto um, but the the question that I think uh, maybe I, I, I understood it there right at the end is you know how would I approach building those systems and I think um, from our side the, the it has to be a partnership. I mean, that's not something that I could do on, on our, my own. And, and it's something that where I need expertise that comes well beyond our, our current capabilities. So this is not something that I see one person or even one organization ever doing on their own. I think it has to be a, a community event. Okay, thanks. Frank, I'll uh, take you next. Uh, maybe okay. uh, please keep your answer to 30 to <laughs> seconds to one minute. We have to look at the time. Okay, so first of all, I will stay at the chat and answer questions. And now the 30 seconds start. Um, I would think that um, it, uh, I would hope that um, it is open so I can see in many points where it, how it works. And then I don't even care whether it comes from the public um, or the private sector. Um, I would be hard pressed to believe that the public sector would do it on their own, but they could have a contribution in there in the form of patents, in the form of some design or assembly. And I think the access model should be very similar to today's supercomputing, which is some of it is distributed on a merit-based system to everybody because the government has bought it from taxpayer money and uh, those who want more buy it on their own. Thank you. And Jerry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would just say that I think probably it's still early to kind of define exactly how it's going to go and things will change over time as there are different sets of applications that get developed on it, right, in terms of what model uh, makes sense, right? And then um, overall, I would just say that the market will drive it, right? I mean, we'll see where the, what the, there's, there's clearly appetite at the moment for, um, for open access and open usage. And then there's also, there's also premium access to research grade systems today, right? And so how does that evolve? And uh, probably it'll, it'll go along the lines of the, the, if I had to guess, it'll go along the lines of the, uh, some of the supercomputing um, access models, but uh, I'm also open to see how this will evolve based off of the types of applications it enables. Okay, well, with this, I think I have to close the session. Thank you for this uh, last three statements. Thank you all for your contributions, the speakers, also the people in the audience for the questions and also the technical people in the background. Um, I hope to see you again in the next session, which will start again, as I said before, at one. And there we will focus, we will be focusing on um, architectural approaches. Uh, we will have a talk from Ifran Siddiqui, Lauren Lecoq and John Martinez. I hope to see many of you there again. And with this, I would like to thank you all again, close the session and please the technical people of the conference stay in the chat so we can solve these technical issues and the co-chairs. Thanks to you all. Bye. Oh.